It has been six months since the Guardians attempt to invade Britannia while trapping the heroes of the realm in an impenetrable dome of black rock, and the realm has been rebuilding in relative peace ever since. During this time, there has been no sign of the Guardian or his dastard Liminian Batlin, whose charismatic leadership during Ultima 7, the Black Gate, had allowed him to create a false religion to aid the Guardian in physically entering Britannia, a plan you managed to foil at the last minute. Finally, one of Batlin's final hideouts has been found, and within his belongings a magical letter which summons a recorded vision of the Guardian, ordering Batlin to follow Gweno to a place called Serpent Isle, implying some evil plan to destroy Britannia will unfold in this mysterious place. Feeling the gravity of the situation, Lord British once more calls for the Avatar, who is still living in Britannia, unable to go home. The Avatar answers the call and gathers up their most loyal companions, Iolo, Shamino, and Dupre, and embarks on the dangerous trip to Serpent Isle, only reachable via a magical portal in the ocean marked by two serpent pillars. The ship sails into the portal, and we enter the main menu. Similarly to Ultima Underworld 2, Ultima 7 Part 2 was released less than a year after its predecessor game and uses the same engine with several tweaks and improvements. This was a style that Origin had first properly tried during Ultima 6 with the Ultima Worlds as spin-off games, which I may play eventually, where the idea was to remain more financially stable by releasing multiple games using the same engine as creating a completely new and increasingly more complex engine for a single game was not only time-consuming, but costly. So getting more benefit from the single engine seemed like a reasonable idea. This would allow a part of the company to work on a new game engine while still being able to release more games in the series without players having to wait multiple years for the next installment. As in The Black Gate, the main menu is rather simple, and an ominous music sets the mood for the game, implying this will not be a happy-go-lucky story. Starting the game is simple, as character creation is non-existent. All you choose are your name and portrait, which also chooses your character's sex. Once you've done that, you're immediately thrown into the game. Or, in this case, flown into the game. After entering the portal at the Serpent Pillars, your ship had entered the void, seemingly flying through it until finally ending up on a shore in this mysterious island. The game is once more played from an almost top-down 2D view, with some absolutely gorgeous sprite work, and the graphical details of the game haven't changed much from Part 1, with many other sprites being reused. Your companions are understandably shaken by the magical journey through the portal and implore you to check your belongings to make sure nothing was lost during this eventful journey. Character sheets are very similar to Ultima 7 Part 1, with the exception that instead of many pieces of gear having a slot around your paper doll, now practically all items you can wear or wield are dragged directly onto the paper doll and have a visual representation on it. This is one of the few major graphical improvements in the game, and the detailed paper dolls are a welcome addition to the game. If you are using the Exalt distributable for the Black Gate, this same paper doll system can be used in that game as well. The other clear improvement is the increased detail in the character portraits during dialogue, some of which are also reused, but from Ultima Underworld 2. The inventory system hasn't changed much either, and things like backpacks can be examined by opening a new window that looks like the container you've interacted with. Within these windows, you can arrange items in any way you want by dragging and dropping them, only limited by carry weight and container size. For once, your party is rather well equipped, having several pieces of magical armor, magical weapons, and a well-stocked spellbook. You also have the Black Sword, within which you trapped a demon in the Forge of Virtue, and the Serpent Statue that you could receive from the goblins in Ultima Underworld 2. This part could be rather confusing since even if you've played through Ultima Underworld 2, it's somewhat unlikely that you would have been able to receive the Serpent Statue in that game, as it's locked behind a very specific set of actions. First off, you need to find the goblins in the sewers, and mostly be kind to them. Except, you also have to chastise them for trespassing, which will allow you to study tracking with them, which you have to do. After this, you have to kill all of the slugs in the adjoining chamber and then play through the game until one major plot point happens very close to the end of the game. 
After that, returning to the goblins triggers new dialogue, in which they have decided to reward you for helping with the slug problem by giving you one of their most prized possessions, the Serpent Statue. If you've done everything except learn tracking from them, all you receive is a fish. In your pack is also a receipt for all of the items received from Lord British's armory, because even the Avatar cannot escape the power of bureaucracy. Feeling that everything is well enough, you begin to explore the new land, as a storm begins to worsen around you. Controlling the character is practically identical to Ultima 7 Part 1. The game is designed to be played exclusively with the mouse, but has some keyboard alternatives. As you move the mouse around the screen, the cursor shape changes, and the arrow and its length determine which direction you will move when you click the right mouse button. Double-clicking the left mouse button attempts to use an object, such as opening a door or the character sheet of a party member. Clicking and dragging with the left mouse button attempts to move an object, which allows you to either rearrange items in the game world or pick up items into your inventory by dragging and dropping an item onto a character whose inventory you want to place it. You can also control the character and the cursor with a keyboard, but it's clearly an afterthought and seems to just emulate what the mouse controls would do. Lightning begins to strike, hitting all around you, eventually striking a companion, who immediately disappears, then another, and another, until you are alone. The storm continues as you rush on the beach, trying to find a safe place to take cover, but you are stopped by a mysterious hooded figure. She tells you her name is Thoxa, a Zenkan monk, and subjects you to a copy protection questionnaire, the answers to which can be found by reading the manual after which she reveals that your arrival has been foretold by a prophecy, which tells of a hero and their three companions, who've come to Serpentile to save the world from a great evil. Serpentile has been subjected to strange calamities, such as the teleport storm you've just witnessed, and mysterious diseases are ravaging the population. Thoxa implores you to find your lost companions and hands you a magical hourglass, explaining that as long as you have the hourglass of fate with you, you can be resurrected upon death and can use it to call the monks to resurrect your fallen companions. Suddenly, another monk appears, but one who has a very different interpretation of the prophecy. He reveals to you that the prophecy in his view says that those who try to help the hero will instead subject the hero to their worst adversities, and says Thoxa is a renegade who was not supposed to help you. The two monks engage in a magical duel with Thoxa emerging victorious, albeit barely. She reiterates that you should find your companions and everything else you've lost before guiding you towards a hidden cave on the path to a city and disappears. Here you are, alone in a strange land with barely an inkling of what is happening, but it is clearly something dire. Thankfully, soon after this, Shamino arrives and is flabbergasted about the situation as you are, and mentions how much of your gear has been transformed into something else, an effect of the teleport storm your party was subjected to. Going towards the city, you can find the cavern Thoxa mentioned and enter it. This area works as a sort of mini-tutorial. Finding the place requires you to pay attention to directions given in dialogue or reading about it in the How to Play section in the manual, as the cavern is hidden behind an illusory wall. Inside, Shamino points out useful items such as a bedroll and a locked chest. There is also a poorly hidden bag behind a barrel in this cave which contains several lockpicks. From this cavern, you can also see another cavern, which can be entered through another illusory wall, but this part is dark, and Shamino suggests you use a torch to see better. This whole sequence is a brilliant way to familiarize the player with several game mechanics in a non-intrusive and intuitive way, without feeling too much like a tutorial. As you continue your journey in the only direction you can, Shamino quickly interrupts the process again, pointing out that there's a very familiar looking magic bow in the ground. He notes that in his belongings is a skull that looks very much like it would fit the skeleton next to which the bow now lies, hypothesizing that this is a way for you to find all of the gear that has gone missing due to the teleport storms. Earlier, when you met Shamino, he wrote a list of new objects that had appeared in your inventories. This list, in combination with the receipt of the magical items taken from Lord British's armory, will help you in your quest to find the missing gear. For once, proving that bureaucracy can be a benefit in some specific instances. Further down the path, the party encounters a large stone fortification, the first sign of civilization on this journey. 
Speaking to the guards reveals many details about this new land and gives you another goal. You've found the city of Monitor, a proud settlement dedicated entirely to the concept of courage. The whole social structure has been built around this concept and the city is managed and protected by three orders of knights. If you do not belong to one of these orders, you are not seen as trustworthy. You also find out about an enchanter who appeared out of thin air to disrupt a funeral and of the dangers people face outside the walls of Monitor, with groups of goblins coming closer and closer to the walls to attack traders and knights. Finally, you're let inside the city, but only under guard, to talk to the mayor, during which you find out more about the tensions in the city. With many patrols going missing because of the goblins, and the orders of knights are having differing opinions on how to deal with the situation. As you're conversing, Dupre is also escorted to the mayor, and your party is now almost complete. Unfortunately, the final member of your party was mistaken to be the Enchanter, as the teleport storm dropped him into an unfortunate situation and is now in the city jail, from where only a knight can release them. Here is where I think was the first proper moment when I began to notice one major change from the Black Gate. Whereas in that game the world was extremely open and a large part of the game was quite free, even if the main story was, in a sense, quite linear. But in Serpent Isle, the story and how you can proceed in it feels way more linear than in the previous games. There is a very specific order the game wants you to do things, and certain things must be done or the game will outright refuse to let you explore further. While this is not necessarily a bad thing, it is something that is markedly different from most of the previous games. Sure, in the Black Gate the story did kind of railroad you forwards, but there were rarely many limitations on where you could go. Serpent Isle adds more of these limitations to player freedom, in exchange for having a more involved plot. I really don't see this as a negative aspect of the game since there is still a lot of freedom, more so in the latter portions of the game, and it does allow the game to tell one of the best stories in role-playing games due to the player having to experience most of it in a very specific fashion. To gain the help of the citizens of Monitor and free Eolo, you have to take the Knight's Test, which in a sense is a simple solo dungeon that acts as a second tutorial, which introduces some puzzle-solving concepts. Reading clues, using items on items, finding hidden passages and avoiding traps, and stacking items to reach otherwise unreachable places, since the game engine, while being in 2D, still has a height axis as well. This is also a place where you're likely to first encounter death, as you're only starting and are left with barely any equipment in an environment where you'll encounter combat. Fighting still works the same way as it did in the Black Gate. You activate combat mode and your party automatically targets enemies based on their chosen combat behavior, which can be changed in the character sheet. During combat, you can move the avatar and manually target enemies, but due to the hectic nature of the real-time combat, this is often completely unnecessary. You can also pause the combat by opening a menu screen, such as the spellbook or inventory, which allows you to do things like heal without taking your attention off the action. A very positive addition that helps with the combat is a new status window, which has a quick reference of the health and mana pools of your entire party, and allows you to change their combat style without having to open the status screen of each character individually. If death catches up to you in this dungeon, it is surprisingly not a big deal. Having the Hourglass of Fate in your inventory means death is not permanent, but instead the monks seen at the beginning of the game resurrect you at their temple. Here, the second monk explains to you more about his interpretation of the prophecy and tells you more of the dire situation that affects the land, before teleporting you back to the location where you died, or at least somewhat close to it. As far as I know, there isn't a penalty for dying. Unlike in many Ultima games where you lose experience, that sets you back significantly, but it's more of an inconvenience, and most of the game's challenge is in trying to learn of this new and strange land and figure out what you're meant to do to complete the game. In that sense, Serpent Isle embodies many features you'd see in adventure games. Dying not being the end, progression being locked behind puzzles and learning about the game world, and so on. The Knight's Test is harrowing. You brave through explosions, various traps and magical creatures, and near the end of your trial. But suddenly, a warrior appears as out of nowhere and fights you until death. 
In his possession is a letter in which a mysterious person only known as X contracts the warrior to murder you within the halls of the trial. Another sign that something about this is not right. Even worse, as you reach the exit, the overseer of the test also attacks you, clearly surprised you came out of the dungeon alive. Now it is all but certain, someone on this island knows of your identity and is already working to thwart your progress. Returning to Monitor, you finally get your knighthood. All that remains is to get a tattoo of the knightly order and attend a banquet in your honor, but even that does not go well. During the feast, the other knights are surprised by your account of the test, proclaiming that it is impossible as such things are not part of the test. But as you continue, their suspicions rise more, and they too are convinced that some evil plot is afoot. A fight ensues, with each order accusing the other of treachery, and the feast comes to a violent end. Not only that, you feel deathly ill, and the town herbalist tells you that you've been poisoned with a rare poison, to which only known cure can be found from another city. This kind of storytelling with twists and turns and treachery is the key feature of Serpentile, and it's difficult to properly explain why this game means so much to me without also explaining quite large portions of the plot. The games taking place in Britannia have their benefits in the sense that those who are already familiar with the world can easily concentrate on the main story beats. But the negative aspect of that is that the world building is still in the game to get new players familiarized with the settings, meaning that somewhat large portions of dialogue are repetition to returning players, which in a way diminishes the amount of enjoyable gameplay. Changing the world also changes this aspect of the gameplay, and even players who are very familiar with Britannia can feel more of the joy of exploring a completely new world again. Being a knight means the citizens now trust you and give you clues about the path both Gweno and Batlin have taken, pushing the main story forwards. Your new status also opens up the services of the city to you, which includes the List Field, where you can spar with other knights of the city. This is a part of the leveling up system of the game. Once more, you level up by gaining experience, but leveling up itself does practically nothing. Instead, you gain training points every time you gain a level, and these training points can be used to increase your attributes, of which there are not many. Unlike the Ultima Underworld games, which had a very extensive skill system, Serpentile is using the very simplified system where you have five attributes that govern all of your actions. Strength, Dexterity, Intelligence, Combat and Magic. These attributes are somewhat self-explanatory. Strength governs things like health and carry weight, Dexterity the chance to hit and pick locks, Intelligence and Magic govern your mana pool and chance to cast a spell, and Combat just makes your fighting more efficient. As your explorations continue, you'll eventually end up in two more cities. The city of Fawn that has built their society around the principle of love, and a Moonshade that has built their society around the principle of truth. These are important details since they mirror the primary principles of the Britannian system of virtues, or at least different interpretations of them. Why they are like that is explained either by reading the manual, which in my opinion is kind of a bad idea, since the game does a great job of giving you information about this world in an interesting way, and learning about that at the same pace as the Avatar, to me, was one of the most enjoyable aspects of the game, which is done by talking to the inhabitants of the cities. In Fawn, your companions make a grave error and toast to the greatness of Lord British. Potentially unbeknownst to the party, the world is very hostile to Lord British, and they know him by many very unflattering names, such as Beast British. This is another part of calling forth lore from older games, as all of these settlements are based on the cities in the older Ultima games. In Ultima 2, the world went through an intense change due to Meenaxis tampering with the space-time continuum. While it was mostly returned to normal due to your actions, in Ultima 3 only one of the four original Caesarian continents remained, and the others had vanished. It is revealed that Serpent Isle is one of these lost continents, and the inhabitants are refugees who've left Britannia to form the country of New Caesarea in Serpent Isle, because they were opposed to Lord British declaring himself the ruler of the world and imposing a philosophy of the virtues on Britannia. Each settlement decided that this is wrong, and religious freedom and self-determination rule over all, and as such they see Lord British as a dictatorial despot. And so they fled through the serpent pillars to create their own society, where each philosophy has the freedom to rule over themselves. 
Of course, these societies are not perfect either, and in fact can be quite horrible. Monitor only respects courage, and the entire society is expected to take the path of the warrior. Fawn only respects beauty, rejecting unconditional love, and superficial qualities separate people into castes, with beautiful people ruling and the least attractive are seen as worthless and banished outside the city walls. Moonshade is the city of mages that disregards pure truth, since illusion is the keystone of magic. In the city, only magic users are seen as true people, and those without magical talents are little more than slaves. As you complete the main stories of each city, receiving the holy items in the process, you'll eventually end up on an isolated island with no means to leave it, where you acquire a serpent jawbone which is said to be the key to teleportation. In game design terms, this acts as your way to see how many fast travel points you've unlocked. The only way to leave this island is by having the jawbone and using the ornate serpent gate you can find. It is very likely you've seen many of these before, and each of them acts as a fast travel point. By using the gate, you're teleported into the dark path, a mysterious place somewhere in the void that links all of these gates together. Each location you can enter is behind a door, and the only way to open these doors is to find a new tooth and insert it into the serpent jawbone. This way, the game limits where you can go, and when, even after unlocking one of the most useful features of the game. One of the locations you can travel to is the island of the monks who introduced themselves at the beginning of the game. Here you can learn more about the prophecy and your true purpose on Serpent Isle. Something has disturbed the balance of the universe, causing a sort of a cascade loop that is slowly but surely destroying all existence, and it is up to you to save it. What that specifically means and how you're meant to accomplish this task, the monks do not know. A nice little easter egg can also be found on the island, as there is a book written about Lord Blackthorn, the villain of Ultima V, who was exiled at the end of that game. Having walked through the Red Moon Gate, he ended up on Serpent Isle, a defeated man. There, the monks of Zenka gave him hospitality and told him of the teachings that speak of us all being equal and how birth, ranks, titles, power and gold are meaningless, for we all depart the world carrying none of it with us and merely our deeds remain as our reflection. Now, with your newfound power to teleport around, it is much easier to complete quests around the island and finally receive your spellbook and a pair of serpent-shaped earrings. For some reason, you also begin to see visions of a vague shape that seems to recognize you. I know that we have met before, stranger. Dost thou not recall? The magic system of the game is very similar to that of Ultima 7 The Black Gate. Spells can be cast either by using single-use scrolls or by choosing the appropriate spell from your spellbook. If you cast a spell from your spellbook, you also need the appropriate magical reagents, which can be either found from the world or purchased from merchants, and enough mana. The game itself does not specify which reagents you need for each spell, but does show you how many times you can cast a spell in the spellbook. To find out which reagents you need, you need to consult the manual. To add spells into the book, you need to either purchase spells from other mages or use the transcribe spell that comes with the book to transfer the spell of a magic scroll into the spellbook. This is an extremely useful feature since transcribing story required spells into the book lowers your chance of softlocking yourself by using one of the few scrolls you can find. With all of the holy items from the three cities in your possession, you can finally open up the next part of the island. But before you can do that, you will encounter a new feature of the game engine, temperature. There are several areas in Serpentile where the temperature is either too low or too high for your party, and you need to appropriately prepare to not suffer damage. For example, in the hot areas you can use a spell that cools your party down, and in cold areas you can equip your party with warm gear, which lowers protection to damage but allows you to survive in the freezing cold. Traveling through the swamp that blocks your progress causes your party to fall asleep, transporting you to a dream world. Waking up from this dream teleports your party back to the entrance of the swamp, effectively acting as a roadblock to your progress. In the dream world, you can talk to the inhabitants and hear about how they are trapped here due to a spell gone wrong, and the only way to escape is to destroy the magical focus that maintains the dream world. With the use of the holy items, you can free the people from their centuries-long slumber. 
These parts of the game I find fantastic. The little stories of each settlement, including the dream world, are wonderfully written, and underlying each of them is some kind of a negative set of circumstances. Serpent Isle is full of these very human stories, and there's very little happiness to be found beneath all the tragedy. So much of what you're doing in the game is not about saving the world from a great evil being, even though that too is a part of it, but most of your time is spent trying to solve the very personal problems of the people you encounter. To me, this is much stronger storytelling than focusing mainly on the larger threat. In this new area, we mix everything together, as you're finally able to catch up to Batlin who taunts you, proclaiming his power will soon rival that of the Guardian before teleporting away. This encounter takes place in an old castle, which Shamino recognizes as his own. Long ago, during Ultima 1, Shamino was one of the monarchs of the Four Continents, and was separated from his kingdom during Ultima 2, as he was visiting Lord British during the calamity brought on by Minex. In his castle, we see the destruction that was wrought upon his kingdom, as goblin tribes rose up and killed every human they could find, leaving behind only angry ghosts and sour memories. Chasing after Batlin takes you into the frozen north, where no human has lived for centuries. Here, you begin to see more of the aspects of Serpent Isle that have barely been touched upon until this point. As the north has been mostly uninhabited, except for wildlife and a friendly tribe of yeti-like creatures, this has allowed remnants of the ancient cultures of the island to survive, and the cold wasteland is littered with ruins of ancient temples and cities. To proceed in your quest, you must learn more about this ancient culture, so you can unlock the secrets of their cities, and chase after Batlin who has holed up in the City of Order. Long ago, after Minex caused the lands to separate, the continents that would eventually form the Serpent Isle were trapped in the void between worlds, from whence the Serpent of Balance released them and taught the inhabitants about the nature of the world. Everything lies in balance between chaos and order, both being represented by their respective serpents. These three serpents reside in the void and control the existence of the multiverse. Now being free from the void, and knowing of the true nature of the universe, the ancient Cesarian cultures were replaced by a new culture, formed around the teachings of chaos and order, each of which has their own forces, around which balance is formed. The forces of chaos are tolerance, enthusiasm, and emotion, while the forces of order are ethicality, discipline, and logic. These must act together to create balance. Ethicality and tolerance create harmony, discipline and enthusiasm create dedication, and logic and emotion create rationality. The three forces of balance. The serpents of each facet are in constant conflict, and the serpent of balance ensures that neither side ever comes out victorious, as each force without its counterpart would inevitably lead to its corruption. For example, tolerance without ethicality breeds anarchy, logic without emotion breeds ruthlessness, and in that sense, as a wise man once said, chaos and order are not enemies, only opposites. Unfortunately, during Ultima 3, something happened that would have far-reaching consequences to all existence. The Serpent of Balance was wrenched from the void and enslaved to serve Exodus as the guardian of his castle. This caused the conflict of the serpents to flare, and order came out victorious. Not only did this mean that the Chaos Serpent was no more, but their conflict caused their followers to engage in a similar conflict, which resulted in a grand war that ultimately brought the destruction of the entire Ophidian civilization. Now you may ask, if Shamina was the king here before the lands separated, how could he still be alive and his old subjects are now considered an ancient and extinct civilization? To that, there are no clear answers other than somehow different dimensions experience time differently, and some people who seem bound by fate age at a slower rate. During your journey to the north, you find that Gweno has been killed and enshrined by the locals in a graveyard of ice. You also learn of the teachings of order and learn to use their symbols to pass the ancient trials, which allows you to finally reach Batlin in the inner sanctum of the city of order. His minions dispatched you surround him, but are unable to move. Batlin taunts you, proclaiming he will soon return strong and immortal from the void, but the wall of light he has opened does not let him through. Shocked, the full realization of what he has done strikes him, as does a lightning bolt summoned by the Guardian who kills Batlin for failing him. 
As the wall of light dissipates, three beings are released from it and quickly they find new places to inhabit, your companions. These beings are the three banes of chaos, each representing one of the perversions of the chaotic forces. In place of your old friends are now the banes of anarchy, insanity and wantonness, all of whom proclaim their intent to spread their will on Serpent Isle as they disappear. You're now alone, and your quest has failed. Not only did you not stop battling, but Gweno is dead, and your friends are now possessed by evil entities wreaking havoc on Serpent Isle, which is exactly what they do. Returning to the settlement reveals the damage the Banes have wrought. Practically everyone is dead. Monitor has fallen to the Goblin Hordes, and Fawn has been filled with monsters, and bodies litter the streets. This is the part where I was convinced that Serpent Isle is truly the pinnacle of storytelling in the Ultima series. Not only is the new world well built, with each settlement and area having its own history, and each of those histories are woven into the larger lore of the series, but the game was willing to deviate from the traditional fantasy RPG storytelling tropes by not only having you fail, but making that failure be felt on almost every aspect of gameplay. Now you have no companions, and have to literally create new ones. The cities have been devastated, making it impossible to level up and purchase provisions, and your companions whom you've known through the entire series are, in a way, responsible for this situation. It is beautiful in its bleakness. Despite things seeming grim, the Great Earth Serpent will now act as your guide, giving you new objectives that will help you restore balance and save the multiverse. This leads to the final part of the game, where if you've not already done so, you are tasked to learn the philosophy of the Ophidians. As to rescue your companions from the Banes and to heal their souls, you have to pass the trials of each Ophidian virtue. In a sense, this part mirrors the ending of Ultima 4, which had you go through multiple trials that ended in a questionnaire testing your knowledge of the Britannian virtues. With the exception that in Serpent Isle, the questionnaires are the trials themselves, and mostly take form of different kinds of puzzles, such as a murder mystery testing your logic. Once the Banes have been defeated and trapped, and your companion souls have been restored, only one thing remains the restoration of balance to prevent the multiverse from collapsing. Unfortunately, you're missing one part of the solution, as only a great sacrifice can bind the broken Chaos Serpent back together. You and your companions draw straws to decide who shall sacrifice themselves to restore the Serpent, and you draw the shortest straw. As you are about to throw yourself into the fires of the crematorium, to pray forcefully stops you, declaring his shame for what his body was used to do as he takes your place in the furnace, stating he thinks you are more important to the world, hoping his sacrifice will somewhat counteract all the evil he feels regretful. This allows you to finally restore the Chaos Serpent, and in a bittersweet moment you hear the voice of Dupre from within. Avatar, it is I, Dupre. My soul is used with the Serpent of Chaos. And you know that his spirit will live on in the Serpent, even if to you he is forever lost. The loss of an important companion who's been a part of the journey of the Avatar in one form or another since Ultima 2 was not something I expected to happen, which probably made the moment even more impactful to me. The final part of the game takes you to the Shrine of Balance, where you're tasked to restore the Balance Serpent to its place to mediate the conflict of order and chaos. You go through multiple more puzzles which test your knowledge again. Previously, the puzzles were about the specific side of the Ophidian philosophy, either order or chaos, but the final area is filled with puzzles where the answers are based on the aspect of balance, acting as a logical conclusion of the quest to learn of the Ophidian philosophy. First learn the opposing sides, then how they act together to create the core tenets of the Ophidians. As the balanced serpent is freed, the immense power released also pulls the Avatar into the void, where you witness the three serpents once more coming together. They speak to you, thanking you for restoring the balance, and as a result, all existence. Only the Guardian is not happy, as he once more foiled his plans, and the game ends with him taunting you before whisking you away to parts unknown. Perhaps you would join me on another world altogether. We do have a score to settle. What plans, you might ask? And understandably so, as the game is not entirely clear about this, and the following is merely my interpretation of all the clues the game has given. 
First off, the Guardian knows of the importance of the Serpents and sent Battling to release the Banes from their captivity, which hastened the destruction of the multiverse. He also knew that Battling was power hungry and wanted him to absorb the power of the Banes, making it impossible to put the Chaos Serpent back together. This part, Batlin failed by not taking appropriate precautions and by using the wrong Blackrock Serpent. This was why he was killed, as he had outlived his usefulness and led to a situation that the Avatar could correct, which you did. But why would the Guardian want to create a situation where all existence is destroyed? Well, for a creature living in the void, destroying everything outside of it would be one way to ensure you've gotten rid of all opposition to your power. After which, a megalomaniac like the Guardian would likely just try to create new worlds in his own image and be, in essence, a god. Serpent Isle is, in one word, amazing. It still suffers from some of the same issues I had with the Black Gate, but in general has improved upon most parts that they could in such a short amount of time that they had to develop the game. The worst part to me is still the combat, which feels uninvolved, and for the most part I just ended up casting mass might and letting things happen, as there wasn't much else I felt like I could do. The issue of keys has been fixed with the inclusion of a magical keyring. Unfortunately, you can only get it from the expansion pack, but it's still better than nothing. And once you have it, you can just press K and try every single key in the keyring on a lock, which is perfect. The expansion itself is only moderately interesting, which is a shame since it takes place hundreds of years in the Serpent Isle's past, allowing you to, in theory, see a part of the conflict between order and chaos. In practice though, you learn little you don't learn in the main game, and the only reasons to bother doing the expansion are the keyring and the most broken item in the entire game. The Ring of Reagents, which allows you to completely ignore any and all reagent requirements for spells, resulting in a situation where only mana limits which spells you can cast. The ending of the expansion is also decent, because if you complete it after the Banes have been released, you get some comfort in the knowledge that your actions will cause the land to eventually heal, and maybe even undo the damage caused by the Banes with enough time. The more linear nature of the game didn't bother me, and I feel like it did contribute to the way the developers could tell a story they wanted to. Serpent Isle is still mostly open, just not quite as open as the previous Ultima games, and I never felt constrained by it, as every roadblock was made to feel like the logical progression instead of an artificial way to prevent you from reaching things you're not meant to yet. Learning about the new philosophy and the links the island had to the older games was quite fantastic, and if the world had been completely open from the start, I don't think they would have had as easy of a time to present all of the knowledge in the game in as logical of a fashion. Another negative part of the game is the possibility of soft locks, one of which I managed to get accidentally at the very end, as I had forgotten to recover one item before going into the final area. And once there, I had no way to go back to where the item was, so I was forced to reload an older save. If I wasn't as neurotic about saving in multiple slots, this could have been the end of my playthrough. There are also multiple other ways to softlock yourself, as from the very beginning the game gives you small and important items, which you may not even know are going to be important, and if you misplace any of them, you've effectively stopped yourself from being able to complete the game. In some instances, the game directly tells you that you can only get this spell once, so transcribe it into your book, and if you don't, well, better reload an older save because you're now locked out of finishing the game. Considering the short amount of time they had to develop the game, I can kind of forgive they didn't create more fail-safes to prevent the player from locking themselves into an unwinnable state. And thankfully there aren't that many of them, so none of it really ended up affecting my enjoyment of the game. And I did enjoy Serpent Isle quite a bit. The story is amazing, some of my annoyances with the Black Gate have been resolved, and even the parts I'm not the biggest fan of aren't really obstacles to me enjoying my time with the game. In the end, this is probably one of my favorites of the entire series, and Serpent Isle deserves a place with the RPG greats. Anyway, that is it for this time. Thank you all for being patient while I've been working on this video, and for all of the support this channel has received in one form or another. One of those forms is Patreon, which is now live and is the best way to support this channel financially. It's obviously not a requirement, nor do I expect it, but in this capitalist world, we all need to eat. And to do that, 
I need to work as much as I can, which does mean that making these videos is not going to happen as fast as they could. Perhaps one day I can focus more of my attention to this and lower the amount of hours I work on my day job. Still, that is it for this time. Thank you everyone for watching and I hope to see you all next time when we see where the Guardian took us in Ultima 8 Pagan. But until then, Fintrovert, signing out.